system in the state, and they really stepped up to help the entire state. Uh, and Michael and uh, the, the leadership he's brought to uh, Northwell, and the, because he knows health care in New York State the way he does, former health commissioner in charge of health for the state of New York, he's really been a fantastic asset. I want to thank him. To my right, Melissa DeRosa, secretary to the governor. To her right, Robert Mejica, budget director for the state of New York. And as I said, it's a pleasure to be on Long Island. It's a beautiful day. It's that bittersweet reality that we're living in. Uh, the news is good today. The weather is good. Uh, so it's good to be here. But I'm not out on the water. I'm not fishing off the south shore of Long Island. I'm not fishing off the north shore of Long Island. Normal days, I would have been doing that by now. A little break, a little piece of sanity. But the news is good. Total hospitalizations declined again. This is an important lesson, though. What you see here, you'll see almost in every state across the state. You'll see in almost every country across the globe. Look how fast that spike comes. Look how fast that incline is, how steep the incline is, and then look at how slow, relatively, that decline is. You can get into trouble quickly with this virus, and it takes you a longer time to turn that curve and to turn that uh, infection rate. So don't let a spike happen in the first place. Learn that lesson. Got it. Uh, net change in total hospitalizations down, change in intubations down, number of new cases, this is an important number that we track, down again, 335. Uh, that's on a system of 53,000, so that's really good news. Number of deaths, uh, again, on a relative scale, the number is down, it's dr down dramatically from where it was in the first place, uh, but it's still painfully high. We are basically back to where we started before this tragedy descended upon us, didn't actually descend upon us. Uh, it actually came from people in Europe, which nobody told us, nobody knew. The, we all thought the virus was in China, and everybody was talking about, watch China, watch China, watch China. Well, the virus had left China, had gone to Europe, and came here from Europe, three million European visitors came on flights to JFK or Newark airports between January, February, March. The Europe travel ban started mid-March. Uh, by that time, three million Europeans had come. Uh, so that's another lesson we have to learn. We're now all excited and talking about reopening. We have all the data-driven metrics that can tell you exactly where we are in terms of reopening across the state. Uh, Albany Capital Region, which has met many of the health metrics, has to get their tracers up and running. We've been working with them to do that. They need 383 tracers. Uh, they found 430 working together, so that's great news. This whole tracing, testing, tracing, testing, tracing, we use these words like people would know what they mean. We've never done testing on this scale. We've never done tracing on this scale. We'll have thousands of tracers uh, who follow up after the testing uh, statewide. So uh, they're now being trained today, and Capital Region should open tomorrow. Long Island is making great progress. Long Island, we were losing about 100 residents per day. We're now down to about 13 per day. When someone asks, well, why did we go through all this pain uh, for uh, two months, three months? Because we saved lives, that's why. Because we saved lives. And if we didn't do what we did, that number of 100 per day would have kept going up. That's why we did what we did. Did it work? You're darn right it worked. Uh, we've saved many, many lives. And you look at the curve in New York, versus the rest of the nation, we're going down. Many parts in the nation, the curve is still going up. Uh, Nassau County is now eligible for elective surgery and ambulatory care. Anyone who needs health service should get it. Uh, there's no reason not to go to the hospital, no reason not to go to the doctor's office, uh, and many reasons uh, why you should go. 
It, uh, denial is not a life strategy. If you have an issue, get it tested, get it resolved. Uh, we're also looking at a pilot program over the next two weeks to start to bring visitors back to hospitals. Uh, that's going to be run by the Greater New York Hospital Association of Downstate uh, and Health Association of New York State Upstate. There will be a number of hospitals participating in that. Uh, Northwell has a number of hospitals. But this is getting visitors back into hospitals with the right precaution, uh, with the right equipment. But it is terrible to have someone in the hospital and then that person is isolated, uh, not being able to see their family or friends. I understand the health reasons for that. We were afraid of the virus spread. But uh, this is a pilot project to see if we can bring visitors in and do it safely. Uh, we're now taking steps to do further reopening with fewer crowds. I'm very aggressive on encouraging sports teams to start and to operate without fans. This is more an economic calculus for different sports. Uh, some sports franchises can make this work easier than others. It depends on how the economics of that sport and how much is determined by uh, selling seats in the arena or the stadium, et cetera. But to the extent they can start, I encourage them to start. The state will work with them to start. Downstate, we have a number of sports teams. Uh, when a team plays, even if there's no one in the stands, it gets broadcast, and that gives people at home uh, entertainment value, something to participate in. Uh, another reason, frankly, to stay home as opposed to go out, and staying home is good right now. So I encourage uh, the sports teams. And again, New York will be a full partner. Anything we can do to make it happen and make it happen safely, we will. Memorial Day is coming up. That is an important American tradition. We want to honor our veterans. Uh, and we want to make sure that no matter what happens, we are still honoring our veterans. The state will allow ceremonies, local ceremonies, of up to 10 people or less. Uh, we hope that those ceremonies are broadcast, televised in their areas so people can be part of honoring that tradition. Uh, local governments can make a decision that they don't want those ceremonies to happen. Uh, they don't want 10 people gathering. 10 is the CDC guideline, is for 10 people gathering. That's where the state got the recommendation from the federal CDC. But uh, I can understand the difference of opinion, so we'll leave it up to local government. Vehicle parades, I think, are appropriate and should be encouraged. Um, and again, this is an important tradition. Many people lost their lives. This is important to many, many families all across uh, this state and nation, it's important to the veterans uh, that they be recognized. And I think we can do that, and I think we can do it safely. Uh, New Yorkers are doing everything they can as a people. Uh, our response has been probably the most demanding in the country because we had the largest number of cases. But every step of the way, New Yorkers have stepped up. Uh, as a government, we are doing everything that we can we're doing more testing than any other state. Uh, we've been uh, more aggressive than any state in nursing home precautions. So uh, we have been smart. New Yorkers have been smart. The government has been smart. Uh, and that should be respected. And now we need a federal government that is as smart as the people who elected that federal government. Uh, because New York, to move forward and move forward quickly, we need a federal government as a partner. They're now in the midst of running a number of programs that provide cash benefits to corporations. Uh, let's make sure when we're giving those corporations funding that the corporations are actually acting on behalf of Americans. I proposed something called the Americans First Law. Not America First, Americans First Law. We learned the hard way in 2008 that you can see government provide billions of dollars to corporations, 
to, quote, unquote, stabilize the economy. We did this after the mortgage scandal. Uh, we gave billions to the banks, remember, because they were too big to fail. So we had to give billions of dollars to the banks. What did the banks do? Uh, many of them turned around and gave themselves bonuses. And they gave themselves uh, parties and uh, end-of-year bonuses and special pay bonuses. These are the same banks that created the mortgage fraud in the first place, then get bailed out by the taxpayer, uh, and wound up having parties at taxpayer expense. I fear what they're going to do this time is they'll take the money from government, uh, but then they'll lay off workers. They're already talking about it. You see these corporations talking about getting lean and restructuring. That means downsizing. Why? Because they think they have an opportunity now many of the employees have been uh, laid off temporarily or temporarily at, at home. The corporations think this is an opportunity to reopen with fewer employees. It would be such a scandal if corporations now took taxpayer dollars and then laid off workers and reopened. Uh, it would be such a scandal and a fraud if these corporations were allowed to receive government money, lay off workers, and then government taxpayers had to subsidize the workers who were laid off. So my law is very simple. If you take government funds, you must rehire the same number of workers you had pre-pandemic. If you take government funds you must rehire the same number of employees you had pre-pandemic. If you want to lay people off, if you want to get lean, if you want to restructure, fine. But don't use taxpayer money to subsidize it. And don't think taxpayers are going to pay you to lay off employees and then wind up with an unemployment problem at the end of the day. That's what happened in 2008. I was attorney general. I brought the cases afterwards. Uh, I brought actions against AIG and against banks like Bank of America that took these bailout funds and then gave themselves bonuses and parties. Don't make the same mistake twice. The American taxpayers are doing what they have to do. Don't make fools of the American taxpayers. Uh, second, Washington was very quick to fund businesses and corporations. The bills they've passed thus far have been about funding corporations and businesses to keep, to prop up the economy. Fine. Who did they not fund? They didn't fund state governments and local governments. Who do state and local governments fund? They fund the hospitals, they fund the police, they fund the firefighters, they fund the school teachers, they fund the food banks. Why was Washington so quick to fund the corporations and the big businesses, but now they have to think about whether or not they want to fund state governments and local governments? The hospitals, the police, the firefighters, school teachers. What sense of priority do you have that you see so clearly the need for corporations, but you don't see the need to continue basic services? And what makes this uh, so offensive to me, you turn on the TV, you see all these ads praising the healthcare workers and the nurses and the doctors who saved so many lives and worked so hard and the first responders who went out there, they're the heroes of today. And they are. And they are. And they should be acknowledged. And they should be funded. If you don't fund New York State government, you know what that means? That means I have to cut aid to Northwell, to hospitals, to nurses, to doctors. It means I have to cut aid to local governments that fund police and firefighters. I have to fund funding to schools, teachers, who also have been heroes doing remote learning, et cetera. Uh, it's about priorities. 
It's about values. And I understand the large corporations are the ones who fund the political accounts of these elected officials. But let them remember that they get elected by the people. People still vote. People still matter. Show the same consideration for the workers that you showed for the corporations. That's all I'm asking. And that's the American's first law and state and local government. And this is not a partisan issue. This is not Democrats versus Republicans. I have stayed 100 miles away from any politics all through this. This is no time for politics. And this is not a political divisive issue. Uh, this is all the governors in the United States. National Governors Association rep represents all the governors. The White House left it to the governors to do the reopening, right? All the states are doing the reopening. You can't tell the states, go reopen, figure it out, and then not provide them with the funding to do it. The head of the National Governors Association is a Republican governor, Governor Hogan. I'm the vice uh, chairman of the NGA. I'm a Democrat. In unison, in a united voice, we're saying to Washington, you need to pass funding for state and local governments. The House passed a bill that did it. Uh, that also provides funding for testing, which is very important, this testing tracing enterprise. Uh, it repeals uh, SALT, which is an additional tax on New Yorkers for the federal government. But the Senate now has that bill. The Senate must act. Uh, also, there was very exciting news about a company that might be close to developing a vaccine. And the federal government is working very hard to accelerate the vaccine, as they should. Uh, the testing, the regulations, the procedures are about uh, getting a vaccine online. Uh, that would be the best possible out outcome. But we have to make sure whatever company finds the vaccine, right, finds the pot of gold, that whatever private company finds that, the vaccine must then be available to all people. And it can't be a situation where only the rich, only the privileged can get the vaccine because one company owns the rights and they can't produce enough for everyone. This is a public health matter. This is a national security threat. This should not be about one corporation's privacy. If the federal government is bending over backwards and jumping through hoops to allow this company to develop a vaccine, then let's make sure the federal government sets the rules now and says to any company that develops the vaccine, the next day we have to be in a position where that patent, that formula can be given to companies all across the globe to produce a vaccine so we can treat everyone. And the last point is this. The world is different today than it was. Uh, there's a, there are situations in life that can happen on a moment's notice and change the very trajectory and definition of your life. You can get health news uh, about an individual that just changes your whole life. What you thought was so important yesterday becomes totally unimportant. This situation this COVID virus has changed the world fundamentally. I don't believe we ever go back to where we were. I don't even believe life is about going back, right? Life is about going forward. But this is a different world. It's a different world individually. It's a different world for families. We're all trying to recalibrate and reassess who we are and how we live and what's important, what's not important. I hope on an individual level, that this period is going to make me a smarter person, a better person, a deeper person. Uh, it's made me question a lot of things about my life, a lot of priorities, a lot of things I was doing. It makes you think through personal relationships and what's important and where have you been spending your time? And was that the smartest use of time? Uh, sometimes when something is taken away, you see how valuable it was. Now you can't go see family members if you wanted to. You can't see friends if you wanted to. 
Uh, when someone says you can't, uh, changes your whole perspective. Then you ask yourself, well, why hadn't I been? Why didn't I? Uh, and when I get a chance, how am I going to do it differently this time? And I think that can actually be a good process to go through. Painful, but good. Uh, but it's also true for government. Uh, government is important again, right? Uh, government, most days, you lead your life, government, politics, it's a sideshow. It's not that important. When does government really become important? Probably almost not in my lifetime. You know, when has it been vital? It's vital at the time of war, uh, crisis, real national crisis. But that's the only time it's really vital, where you don't have a choice but to deal with and rely on government. Well, government is now important again. In a way, it hasn't been in my lifetime. Uh, it matters what government does. Government has made the difference between life and death here, right? Uh, because government is part of social action. And the people who saved lives in this are New Yorkers for doing the right thing. But government was part of that. Right? It helps organize. Uh, today, government's going to be held to a different standard. And it has to be fundamentally different. It has to be smarter than it was. It matters now what happens. You have to know what you're doing now. Not just look like you know what you're doing. Not just sound like you know what you're doing. You have to be smart. You're not going to tweet your way through this. Uh, you have to be smart. You have to be competent at what you do. There's something called government. And you either know how to do it or you don't know how to do it. You know, for many years, we just, anyone can be in government. You know, uh, I don't know. Can anyone be a nurse? Oh, no, you have to know what you're talking about. Can anyone be a doctor? No, no, you have to know what you're talking about. Can anyone be a lawyer? No, 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 you have to know what you're talking about. Can anyone be a plumber? No. You have to know what you're talking about. Can anyone run government? Oh, yeah, anybody can run government. Uh, the less you know, the better. Well, that wasn't true. You have to be competent. And it has to be beyond politics. This is not about an ongoing campaign. You're now a government official. You represent everyone. Forget the politics. Represent people. And it doesn't matter, Republican, Democrat. That's all garbage now. I'm the governor of New York. All New Yorkers, I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, atheist, I don't care if you vote, I don't care if you don't vote. That's your business. Uh, I represent you. You pay me to represent you. That's how I see it. Uh, and government has to be fair and it has to be effective. That's where we all are now. And that's where we've been in New York. And that's what it means to be New York tough. As a person, as a society, as a collective, and as a government. To be smart, to be united, to be disciplined, to be loving, that's New York. Questions? Governor, uh, two questions. First, from the MTA. Uh, this morning, MTA executives were asked about when reopening happens on Long Island and New York City, whether people can commute to work by mass transit, and whether they have enough capacity. Phil Lang, the Long Island Railroad president, said he's looking to the state for guidance about whether they can run more trains. So would you tell them to do so? And my second question is about the child multi-inflammatory syndrome. How many cases are there now in the state? Do you have it broken down at all by county? And do we have any idea how these children have been exposed? Yes, 120, and no. <laughs> <laughs> Just playing with you. The, uh, the MTA... The MTA, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, runs the subways and buses and commuter rail in downstate New York. First of all, the MTA, talk about being better for this experience. The MTA is going to be better. The trains are cleaner today than they have been. We did something on the, on the subway service, which is for the first time we stopped running trains for several hours at night. The trains always ran 24 hours a night, uh, 24 hours a day. We stopped running trains for several hours. 
That allowed us to do two things. First, we had to disinfect trains, which we had never done before. We cleaned trains. Nobody ever talked about disinfecting a train from a virus, right? How do you do that? All those trains, all those buses, subway stations. We disinfect all the trains. And to disinfect the trains, we had to get everybody <coughs> off the trains, including homeless people. And homeless people shouldn't have been on the trains in the first place. Why are you sleeping on a train? We can do better than that. It's not good for a homeless person. It's not who we are as a society. We're going to be good to you. Uh, we're going to let you sleep on a train. No, we're going to get your help. We're going to get your services. We're going to get your shelter. So the trains are cleaner than they've been. I believe the MTA is going to be better for this, and the service is going to be better. When we are ready to open, the MTA will be ready to open. Uh, second question on the the uh, multi-inflammatory pediatric syndrome. This is a very serious issue. I think we spotted it in New York first. I think it's gonna get much worse before it gets better. I don't think this is New York. I don't think it's only 120 cases in New York. I think that's the tip of the iceberg. And I think there's a whole iceberg under that tip. I'm not a doctor, but that's what I think. And that's just my opinion, but it's not a fact. Uh, uh, that is, we know what the common denominator is. 90% are children who test positive for the COVID virus or COVID antibodies, which means they either have the virus or they had the virus, 90%. And they are exhibiting inflammatory symptoms as, a, as an immune response to the virus. Blood vessel inf inflammation, heart inflammation and some other disorders. But it's an inflammatory response to the COVID virus. Now, it didn't look like the COVID virus because it wasn't respiratory. So they all looked at these cases as uh, an inflammation issue as opposed to a COVID issue. But when you go back and look or test, they were COVID positive for the virus or the antibodies. Uh, so that is an ongoing situation. The more states that look, the more states find cases. The more countries that look, the more countries find cases. So I believe we discovered it. We've given the, the nation and the world a heads up, but I think it's going to be worse before it gets better. The, the number is actually 137 is the confirmed cases. That doesn't align perfectly with what Mayor de Blasio put out because the number he's reporting is suspected cases. So the 137 is the confirmed cases in New York as of right now. Do you have any sense of how these kids are being exposed? Is it from family members with COVID? That's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, you know. Uh, we do know this. On the new COVID cases, which surprised me, frankly, the new COVID cases that are coming in the door, about the 300 per day, those are basically infections coming from people who are at home and not working, which was shocking to me. I thought they were going to be essential workers who were out there every day being exposed to people. They're not. They're people who are at home. So it's more of a community spread. That's why the personal behavior is so important. They're not getting it on a train or a bus uh, or as an essential worker. They're getting it at home, talking to someone on a park bench, uh, leaving their apartment building. That's where they're getting it. And I was 100% wrong on that, one of many, many times. It's, sir, with all due respect, you say this isn't a political issue, not Democrat, Republican, and so forth. But with all due respect, the Republicans in the Senate have made it a, a political issue, and they've made it clear that the, you know, the state aid is a bailout for blue states, and they're not going to stand for that. They've, 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 they've made it clear they're not going to take up the House bill. And, and so I say, and if you look even at the um, um, uh, financial scandal, with McConnell, people desperate, losing their homes, their jobs, he basically said his priority was making Obama one-term president. He made that whole thing political. So may I ask, since you've been so realistic, you've been so numbers uh, driven, how do, you, how do you deal with that? I know you've said that these senators have to go home and be reelected and so forth like that, but they've, they've shown 
that um, the virus is really affecting Democrats more than it's affecting Republicans. The people who are dying are more likely to be Democrats than Republicans. And so may I ask, what would yes. be your strategy? The, just to make sure we're both uh, saying uh, the same thing, that is my position. I'm saying there is no, first of all, there's no doubt that many politicians act through politics. I'm saying today, and in this situation, they should rise above, and this should not be about politics, it should not be about red and blue. Uh, the people who are dying here are not Democrats or Republicans, they're Americans. Uh, it's not red and blue, it's red, white, and blue. Uh, to talk about, I'm not gonna bail out blue states, is just such an ugly uh, concept in this situation where people are dying and you want to start to say, well, are they Democrats or Republicans? I mean, how does that work? You get the death toll and you say, okay, how many were Democrats and how many were Republicans? I mean, it's just an ugly, repugnant concept. And it's not even true, by the way. Uh, bail out New York. New York bails out them every year uh, without saying a word. We, we give the federal government about $30 billion more every year, right? Federal government is a pot. Every state puts money into the pot. When we pay our federal taxes, we put in $30 billion more per year than we take out. Senator McConnell's state takes $30 billion more every year than they pay in. So we put in 30. His state takes out $30 billion more every year. That's the bailout. Uh, I haven't heard him saying for the past 30 years, oh, no, no, no. We should only take out what we put in. We don't want any handouts from New York. We don't want any largesse from our northern neighbors in New York. You know, he was just, he was just fine taking that bailout year after year after year. But... Uh, I didn't, you know, to, to raise it now in the midst of this, uh, not only is it ugly and repugnant, it's even counterproductive and self-destructive. So what, you don't want to help New York and California? You don't want to help the Northeast and the West uh, because you think there are Democrats there who are dying? And if the New York economy doesn't come back and the California doesn't, economy doesn't come back, then what happens? to the other states. I mean, it's not even smart on any level. It's ugly and unintelligent, which is a really bad combination in life. Governor, you've said uh, repeatedly that the virus was brought here from travelers from Europe to JFK and Newark airports. Let's learn the lesson. So these flights, there are still flights from Europe and Asia coming to those airports. What is being done now to screen those travelers? What is the step-by-step -step process and also uh, your health department tells me that it is not tracking these travelers, so how do you make sure they stay quarantined for four, 14 days, as I understand they're being directed? Yeah, because the state health department doesn't do it because it's not a state role. We don't, the state government does not do borders and customs. That's the federal government does bus, border and customs control. So when you come in from overseas, passport control, et cetera, that's all a federal function. Uh, the federal government, not that I'm the best spokesperson for the federal government, nor do I hold myself out to be, but they would say, uh, we did a China travel ban uh, beginning of February. We did a European travel ban mid-March, uh, to which I say, yeah, both were too late, as we now know. President Trump himself says the virus came from Europe and it had moved from China. Uh, CDC now says it, federal agency. They didn't say it at the time. It would have been better if they said it January, February, March, right? But lessons learned. Uh, and they would say there's a China travel ban, a European travel ban. You would have to ask the federal government, how do you enforce that at the airports? There are some exceptions to the bans. Uh, and they've been criticized for that. Despite the China ban, about 400,000 people from China came over. Uh, there are exceptions to the European travel ban. Uh, 
but that would be up to the federal government. We do not, we do not do, state does not do uh, customs, border, passport control. That's all the federal. Is there any coordination? There is coordination, but they determine who comes, who doesn't come. That's purely federal. Uh, and they determine what procedures and practices are in place for those who do come. State has no role in that whatsoever. And it's not like we have the kind of relationship that they're looking for gratuitous advice from me. Do you think these flights should be canceled at this point? I think they should have been, uh, we should have known, well, in a perfect world, and if we have to run the videotape and if we have to get ready for the next situation, the question would be, how did we not know that the virus was going to leave China and go to Europe? Why did the federal officials, the international global organizations think the virus was going to be sitting there in China waiting for them uh, to arrive two months later. I mean, we all talk about global interconnections and, and mobility, right? Okay, so the, China, the virus is in China in November, last November. It's in China last December. How long does it take one person to get on a plane from China and go to Italy, which is what they did? and then bring the virus with him to Italy. In March, we think it's still in China, November, December. Now, this is not my role. This is not what governors do. It's not what states do. I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm not the CDC. I'm not NIH. I'm not any of these things. But just common sense, that would be the question I would put forth. Governor, a question on nursing homes. Excuse me one second. Does anyone want to add anything on any of this? Sorry, on nursing homes, who will process the COVID-19 tests that are now required that the nursing homes give employees, and then who pays for that? Two things on testing. We now have more state testing capacity than we have people taking tests. How ironic is that? We worked so hard to get the testing capacity up, right, because everything has been testing capacity, testing capacity, testing capacity. We now have, for example, drive-ins that can do 15,000 tests a day. Only 5,000 people are coming. Uh, I've said a number of times, wear a mask, get a test. Any essential worker who is, uh, deals with the public can get a test. Anyone exposed to a person who turns out to be COVID positive can get a test. Uh, any healthcare worker can get a test. Any nursing home worker can get a test. Any nurse can get a test. Get a test. You're in a, we did put in a requirement that the nursing home operators are not that happy with, some of them that says a nursing home staff person has to get tested twice a week. Uh, they think this is unduly burdensome. I understand the burden, but if a person only gets tested once a week, let's say they get tested on Monday, uh, that means, in theory, Tuesday they could become infected. Then they're infected Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, exposing people in a nursing home until they get tested again. Twice a week uh, is an operational burden, but these nursing homes are ground zero for us. They're the most vulnerable population, senior citizens, in the most vulnerable place, a congregate setting. So we said tested twice a week. Now, the nursing home can do it, and we provided hundreds of thousands of test kits uh, for it, or an employee can use the other facilities to get a test, you can walk out of here today, go to CVS, get a test, go to Rite Aid, get a test, go to a drive through get a test, go to a doctor's office, get a test, go to a hospital, get a test. So there are numerous places that you can go get a test uh, right now. And for nursing homes specifically, we're sending them the test kit so they can do it on site. Let's take one more. Uh, Governor, I've got... You, know, you had your hand up, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, Governor, uh, regardless that you signed the law, the 90-day freeze on the evictions, a family from Queens was evicted yesterday. Officers from HPD and the police department went to the house and took them out. They, regardless that they had a letter sent by your office, 
that they post in the in their door, the officers use laugh and they say they had the power to do. Is this right? If they were evicted for non-payment of rent, it is not right. If you give me the name of the family, I will follow up today. Anything else from the August group who's here, Mr. Dowling, head of Northwell, healthcare expert? Any last words before we go back to work? No. But, no? Uh, a lot of good things happening, and um, just keep moving forward and do it the right way. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the time. Uh, we're going to see, I've said repeatedly that uh, we're waiting to get the number from the federal government, what they're going to give us in terms of aid, and then we'll know where we are. Well, but we can't. Well, we'll see in a couple of more weeks. Well, we'll see in a couple of more weeks. But if the federal government doesn't act in a couple of weeks, they will be more reckless and irresponsible than uh, even I thought they were. And that's saying something. <laughs> up to the local governments. Thank you, guys.